What's up guys, it's Dwayne back again for another video, back again for the reaction and today's a great wonderful day because it's a Sweden day and this one's interesting, how a botched bank heist created Stockholm Syndrome. Without further ado, let's get into this reaction, let's go. The bank had just opened, a tall muscular man wearing a wig, makeup, and a pair of sunglasses, walked into the bank. He ripped out a submachine gun, fired it into the ceiling, and shouted, the party starts. Down on the, the floor. The party starts. Jan -Eric Olsen. That is an awesome way to kind of, <laughs> even though it's really bad, it's obviously the bank heist, but it's an awesome way to kind of like a one-liner. Um, the reason why I'm watching this is because on my Patreon, I'm watching Clark. Don't know if you guys have seen Clark before. It's a Swedish uh, TV show, which is all about Stockholm Syndrome. It's all about Clark Olofsson and his whole exploits, his whole life that led up to his bank um, heist. So I'm really interested to see the true and the real story of how it happened. Like, because I'm literally obsessed with this TV show. And we're on the last episode uh, this Friday. So if you want to run over to our, my Patreon and links in the description and you want to get involved and watch it with me, we're watching the last episode this Friday. Um, but yes, this is why I'm watching this video because I want to learn what really happened. Um, on this day, so yeah, let's go. Olsen or Yane, who was a master safe cracker, very good at opening safes. When Olsen stormed into a bank in Stockholm, Sweden, he wow. began a true crime escapade that seems like a work of fiction. It's the subject of a new book. My name is David King, and I wrote Six Days in August, the story of Stockholm Syndrome. Right. He ran around the room, slammed a transistor radio that he pulled out of his bag onto the counter. So rock music was blasting throughout the lobby. And he started taking hostages. Olsen took four captives. Christine Inmark, she was 23. She loved to read, loved music, the Beatles. There's Elizabeth Oldgren, the youngest of the hostage. She had just turned 21. She was a lawn woman that was often used as a human shield. There's Brigitte Lundblad. Who was 31, who's a mother. She had two small children at home. And the fourth one was Sven, Sven Sefström. He made his demands. He won three million Swedish crowns and Clark Olofsson. Clark Olofsson was one of the most notorious criminals in Sweden at the time. Mm. He was a bank robber, a celebrity. He was a media star. He was known for these daring bank robberies, these breaks out of prison, leading police on manhunts. Clark and Yane were friends in prison. The police arrive on the scene very soon. And so does the media. While they're waiting, trying to figure out what to do, they're bringing sharpshooters and snipers. They're going to be wow. all around the square. Sweden was a, you know, a nice place. He thought he would get his way. Of course, they're going to give me what I want because you know human lives are worth more than a few million Swedish crowns. <laughs> Remarkably, the police conceded to one of Olsen's demands and brought Clark Olufsen to the bank. That's but the incredible. standoff continued. The fact the police were like, yeah, 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 okay, we'll bring this convicted criminal bank robber to the bank um, and just, like, concede to one of your demands. Even though, no, no, like, Clark Olufsen is, like, notorious for robbing banks. They brought him to the bank <laughs> to be with his friend, to help his friend rob the bank you can't make this stuff up it's it's so fascinating that this happened and the the tv show so far i'm watching and looking at this the clark tv show is that like perfect and the satire in it is so so funny yeah if you guys haven't seen it like you have to watch it if it's not with me watch it on your own like clark is such a good uh netflix show but if you want to watch it with me like i said the, the link's in the description but it's so good we really shoot this is nice sweden but again they're, they're sharpshooters how much is a promise of free passage worth when they have sharpshooters they have you right there they think they can hit it as so such that yana the gunman made sure to try to have a hostage near him as a human shield as much as possible Olsen and Olafsson and the hostages retreated into the bank vault. They're in the vault and the police decide to lock them in the vault. They lock wow. the hostages in with the gunman. They're gambling that this guy 
is not going to kill them. So they better hope they're right because they just locked them up with it. Days That's passed wild. with no resolution in sight. They, they had reached a stalemate and no one had any idea how they're going to get out of this. So the police have to come up with something else. So there, all these ideas are proposed on how we're going to end this. And eventually they come up with the idea, drill holes in the vault and gas them. The police began to drill holes in the ceiling of the vault as Olson tried to keep them at bay. So he has the idea he's going to rig up a bomb. And he does that and, and blows up the drill. So that stops it for a little while. So they're all very happy. And then the police, they get another drill. So they keep drilling and they keep drilling. Olson made another move. His biggest plan takes everybody by surprise. In his bag that he had when he came into the bank, he pulls out some rope. No one saw when this was done, but the rope is tied in the form of nooses. So he ties nooses around the hostage's neck, fix it to the safety deposit boxes in the wall, makes wow. them stand up and tells the police, okay, if you send in gas, the hostages will be the first to die and it will be your fault. And the police, whoa, what are we gonna do now? They want to confirm this. How did he think of doing that? Like he, he would have thought, oh, when I rob this bank, I'm gonna take hostages and I'm gonna bring rope with me. Did he have the idea that he was going to hang them or was the rope always going to be that deterrent? Like, how do you think of that stuff? I feel like this guy had thought of robbing this bank for years and years and years, years and years and years. Because I feel like he's thought of all the contingencies, all the, all the different variables of what might go wrong or might go right. To have a bag full of, like, rope, like, I don't know, it's just, it's mad. It's like, it's no wonder like it created the best TV show ever. Smartly, maybe he's bluffing. You know, but they send a camera down through one of their holes and take a picture of the hostages during the crisis. They only see three of the four hostages there, but over their heads, they see the nooses. So they know, it's, you know this is for real. Faced with no good options, the police made a decision. They decided to use the gas. So they pumped in gas out of three of the holes at the top. They had sharpshooters at two other holes in case they needed to shoot. And they, and they used lights on the others. And the code word was turn on the lights. And that's when the gas started coming into the vault. You could just hear the screams, the cough. It was burning their eyes, burning their skin. Oh going, you know, affecting the nose, the lungs, respiratory system. It's uh, not pleasant. It takes over 30 minutes before they can finally get everybody out. Fortunately, nobody dies from the time the gunman goes into the bank until the, the finale. It's 131 hours, which is a long time wow. for a hostage drama. One thing that made this hostage drama different was the relationship that developed between the captives and the captor. Mm, this is what I find that the most fascinating, like Stockholm Syndrome as just a concept, like they literally started to care for their captors what it, yeah it, that yeah that's insane that's that's not insane but it's just like it's so interesting how that happened but um as i did speak out on my patreon i spoke to my patreon uh, the few family members and i said when you watch clark Ollison and then the relationship that they built with him it's kind of like they know that the police are throwing tear gas in there they're charging there with guns they're like basically all the moves that they made drilling holes that could have led to them all being killed and they're thinking wait a minute the police are doing like all this and they they don't care if we get killed or not whereas the people with the guns the people the the people that have captured me they're the only ones keeping me alive right now like <laughs> the police are not, they don't care they don't care they're gonna run in there with guns tear gas all this type of stuff the only people that are keeping me safe are the people that have captured me i can understand why you could develop um a, almost a sort of like um relationship or love not love but like you know they're your they're your keeper they're your minder they're your carer like they're the only people that are keeping you safe safe it's, yeah, the concept is uh, so interesting. And at the end, when, when they do come out of the vault, the police see the hostages, some of the women give the captors hugs. Uh, they say, we'll write, take care, 
and another one is saying, you know, don't, don't Ooh, harm right. That bond between the hostages and the hostage takers would eventually be called Stockholm Syndrome. The Stockholm Syndrome hey, is Kat. traditionally viewed as a psychological phenomenon that develops between a captor and a captive. Under this extreme stress, a hostage can, according to the theory, develop sympathy with the captor, can identify with the captor, and, and form powerful bonds with the captor. If someone threatens your life, threatens to kill you, but yet they preserve your life, they end up securing basic things for you, like food, other things mm -hmm. like that, these simple kindnesses can be magnified under the stress and under violence. The captive and the captor, they identify with each other. They form powerful bonds. And these bonds could be anything from gratitude to affection to love, according to the theory. Yeah. The police should encourage this wow. bond. It's like abusive. It's like an abusive, like being in an abusive relationship with someone that beats you every day. Um, and, and does like horrible things to you, but then shows you love, um, you know, whether it's doing something small and they show you love, it's kind of that reinforcement of that reinforced kind of, that, you know, like having a pet and when you, oh, when you have a kid and you say, no, that's naughty, but when they do something good, yay, that positive reinforcement helps people like it gives it gives that that feeling of like oh there's something good oh and that it's it's ah i can't explain what i'm trying to explain but you know what i'm trying to explain <laughs> that's what stockholm syndrome is like they get in such like he said stressful situation yet when they're faced with like life-threatening situation but then the captors like giving them food and being nice to them they they just have this intense closeness with that that person feeling like they could change that person kind of like oh it's crazy you know, if you're a hostage if you cannot overpower them if you cannot run yeah if you cannot hide yeah what do you do well one thing is to try to get along with them so this could be one way to help save your life until you figure out how to overpower them run hide or, or get rescued this is this is not perfect but there were strategies. Less than a year after the Swedish bank situation, another high profile case would popularize the idea of a bond between captor and captive, the kidnapping mm. of Patricia Patty Hurst. Patricia Hurst, she was a art history major at Berkeley. She was 19 years old. She was very famous in 1974. I mean, the Hurst family was fabulously rich. A group calling itself the Symbionese Liberation Army kidnapped the heiress from her apartment. Two months later, she's filmed robbing a bank with her captors. And she's also sending messages out. She has a new name, Tanya. She's taking a new revolutionary name. And she's denouncing the establishment. She's denouncing the FBI. And she's joined with them. And she became associated also with the Stockholm Syndrome. Their argument at the trial was that she was under duress because she was taken captive. Was she the innocent young girl who was brainwashed? Not herself when she robbed the bank, which under American law would be sufficient wow. grounds for acquittal? Or was she Tanya, the willing revolutionary who is now trying to save her skin? Hearst was convicted of bank robbery and sentenced to 35 years in prison. President Carter commuted her sentence in 1979 and she was released after serving 22 months. The theory of Stockholm Syndrome had some popularity with psychologists, though it's not officially a syndrome. But the idea of it really would take root in popular culture. They have already killed one hostage. We've seen the movie Die Hard. It's a curious oh, yeah, Die reference. Hard. They have a reporter mentioning it on television when they take hostages in the movie. And this reporter's interviewing a psychiatrist and says, yes, we're seeing the early stages of the Helsinki Syndrome. It's when the hostages and the terrorists go through a sort of psychological transference. And the reporter says, oh, as in Helsinki, Sweden? You see the, the guy that- As in Helsinki, Sweden. Finland. Or slap his head and say, no, no, Helsinki, <laughs> Finland. But for some reason, I mean, I went back and looked at the original script. It does say Helsinki syndrome. So you see on The Simpsons, there's a Simpson episode where they go to Brazil and Homer gets kidnapped. Where are you taking me? Shut up. And starts to get along with his captors. He's starting to create a, a scrapbook. 
So they start talking about the Stockholm Syndrome and there's Looney Tunes. Daffy Duck <laughs> gets this idea that Porky Pig is the suburban strangler that he's heard about in the news. Chubby, short, and bald, with a pig-like nose? If you see anyone matching this description, call 911. And so he's over at Porky's house, and he thinks he's been kidnapped, and he wonders at one point, he starts to like Porky, his friend, is like, do I have Stockholm Syndrome? <laughs> and I fall in love. So from that one event has now created this, this reference, this name of this syndrome, syndrome called Stockholm Syndrome. Insane. Clark Olufsen, and he's still alive, isn't he? I bet he's just like, oh, I'm just like, I'm just, I'm just ridiculously famous. Like, they, they've got me on a Netflix documentary. They've got me on a Netflix TV show. I'm just, I'm just that guy. I'm just amazing. I'm in love with my captor. <laughs> oh no, I've got Stockholm Syndrome. There was even a recent Ethan Hawke movie that dramatized the original Stockholm incident. It's called Stockholm. We will let the ladies go when it's over. One quibble David King has with the so-called Stockholm Syndrome is the name. So do you really have to call it syndrome? Syndrome sounds like, you know, signs or symptoms of a, a form of a distinct clinical picture of a disorder. But is it really a disorder? I mean, again, if you can't overpower mm. them, if you can't run, you can't hide, you, is that sick to want to live? Maybe I think it's a syndrome strategy. is probably not the best term. I think it's a, it makes a lot of sense as a survival strategy, as a coping mechanism. And I think yeah. the syndrome is misleading. And if you're not careful, you come into blaming the victim. This is Inside Edition. Yeah, Digital. yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. It's a strategy. It's a, it's a yeah, coping mechanism. Survival of the fittest. Like, I need to befriend this person, otherwise they're going to kill me. So I need to make them my best friend. And in the process of trying to make them my best friend, actually, I might actually start liking them. They might, actually, they're not too bad. You know, in, in all, all things considered, you know, they're not trying to kill me right now. Um, and we get along. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, you got to do what you got to do. Wow. That explains what happened at that bank robbery then. I just had to watch this because I just needed to know if the Clark TV show was accurate to what actually happened. And it actually, it's pretty accurate, um, which is pretty cool. Guys, thank you very much for watching. Until the next one, I will see you soon.